Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, it gives me really uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, my good friend, Mike Perfit, who is going to deliver, uh, I guess, what would be the 10th tube lecture. Um, before I, I, I talk a little bit about uh, Mike's um, kind of interest in, in the ocean floor, I just want to make a couple points. Um, you know, the Earth's most active volcanoes are underwater, and uh, they make up 70, they produce 70 percent of the Earth's surface. And Mike uh, is, is one of the world's experts at, at how these volcanoes work and, and what they do to make the oceanic lithosphere. Um, and it's a process that goes on all the time under our noses, and we wouldn't know about it unless you go there. And so one of the key features of Mike's um, uh, uh, career is he's, he, he's, he's gone there in many ways, gone down to the ridge, looked at it as a, as a volcanic uh, object of study, something to try to uh, uh, get the details of, of how these volcanic processes work. Mike did his undergraduate um, degree at St. Lawrence, and then he went to Columbia where he worked on a, um, um, worked with a string of advisors there, including uh, Doc Ewing, Bruce Heason, Bob Kay, and Ian Ridley, and I w we were joking about whether he'd been the one to tire them out <laughs> successively <laughs> as he worked his way through the, uh, the senior staff at, at Lamont. <laughs> then he went to uh, ANU uh, where he worked with Ross Taylor, who, who many of us in the audience know, and um, uh, uh, as a research fellow. And, and one of Mike's early interests uh, stemmed from his PhD work uh, where he worked in arcs. He, he really started out as a petrologist working in, in arcs. He worked in, in the Caribbean and the Cayman, uh, Cayman Trench. He worked in the Aleutians. And, uh, for his uh, research fellowship at ANU, he worked at, uh, in Papua New Guinea. Now, it's interesting because I asked him how he got interested in ridges and working on uh, uh, ocean floor volcanism, and he said, well, his colleague, uh, Dan Fernari, who, who plays prominently in, 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 in the facilitating undersea work that Trish talked about yesterday and Mike's going to talk about today, had um, been working on Alvin and uh, had all these samples, but no one was analyzing them. And so Mike saw this golden opportunity and it's interesting because when I first came to Carnegie, I had a suite of samples that had the very same characteristics. They were collected by Alvin, no one was working on them, and we decided to, to do isotopes on them. Uh, this is stuff I did on the oceanographer fracture zone. But he got, uh, so we both got interested in, in, in working in ridges through the availability of these Alvin samples. Um, Mike is uh, quite distinguished. He's an AGU fellow. He's a GSA fellow, and at the University of Florida, he is a distinguished professor. He was a chair of the department there from 2007 to 2013, and at Florida he was one of the key people to single-handedly save that department from being decimated by um, lunk-headed administration, to yeah. put it mildly, right? Yeah. Um, don't, don't, he's get <laughs> don't get him started. So he, he, <laughs> he, he's, he's uh, spawned some really excellent students, Matt, Matt Smith, John Chadwick, and Dorsey Wanless, uh, who, who many of us know. and. Um, but he's best known, perhaps, for his work on the East Pacific Rise at Nine North, which is one of the most magmatically active areas uh, and has had the, the, the unique uh, opportunity to go back to an area of the ridge, um, what, 10 years between those two cruises, something like that? Between where the eruptions? Between the eruptions? 13, yeah. 13, yeah. So he was, he was one of the few people that's actually gone to the ridge, see it erupt, and come back 13 years later and see it re-erupt. And so that's really quite unique. So Mike is going to talk today about submarine rifts and volcanoes. Vents and eruptions in the deep sea. <coughs> Let's see. Oh wait, one last thing. Oh, there's also a. a, a really I didn't uh, ask him to do this. Yeah, <laughs> I'm getting a small cut from Amazon, but so Mike, Mike has got two very interesting, popular books. Um, he's a co-author with uh, Jeff Carson, Deb Kelly, and Dan Fernari, and uh, Tim Chang on this book called Discovering the Deep. A lot of what you'll see today, mm -hmm. uh, the background in the sleep material in this book, really an excellent. Uh, And any of you out there, actually. <laughs> and, and Mike will have a table out there to sign this book. <laughs> and, and, and it doesn't really describe us as older than dirt, but I, I kind of was worried about that. Well, it's, it's funny because I got a hat for my co-author, who's a children's book illustrator and writer. Actually, I got him a hat to wear that says older than dirt on it. <laughs> and he, and he does wear it. So now how do I make sure this is on here? Is this good? Yeah. There we go. OK. All right. Okay, well, th thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me here for this talk and to be a TUV fellow. I, I look back at 
previous two fellows, and I'm in an incredible company. You know, I feel honored really to be here. Remarkably, I have never been here before. It's one of those places where you come to Washington all the time and you hope to come up here and don't get here. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm here until uh, November 16th or so. I'm happy to talk to people. Steve and I have one little project we're talking about, but mostly it's a chance to get away from my department and actually do some work, close my door, and get something done. So I would like to um, talk about the seafloor today. I don't want to end the show. How did this happen? OK, that should get it going. Huh? OK. OK, so why study mid-ocean ridges and seamounts? Really, they're the most extensive volcanoes on Earth, and they create 70% 70 70 of the Earth's crust, the surface, the surface crust. So obviously, we, we should know something about it. Um, the geochemistry of the rocks, which is what I'm mostly involved with, uh, that form the oceanic crust, provide information on the composition and evolution of the Earth's mantle, something lots of us, you, do one way or another um, here at Carnegie. Uh, the key here is that the rocks that are erupted, particularly the ones that freeze when they hit the seawater and form glassy surfaces, are not contaminated. And they only come up through basically rocks that are just like themselves. So the contamination, if it's there, is very minimal, mostly, mostly. Much of the contamination from the atmosphere, hydrosphere, and continental crust does not happen in the oceans because of the thin crust and before because of the homogeneous composition. Now, having said that, I actually worked on a paper with Steve and a postdoc, uh, Petrus LaRue, where we looked at some volatile contents, namely chlorine. It turns out that they somehow assimilate some sort of brine that's in the crust. So there's a rock hydrothermal uh, alteration process that goes on even the in the magmatic state. But otherwise, they're, they're pretty clean. So not to belabor the point here, but we've got all these ridges that are about 60,000 kilometers long. Some people would say up to 70,000, depending on what you consider uh, ridges. Um, I'm going to focus on this area right in, in here between the Pacific and Cocos Plate. This is the so-called nine north section of the East Pacific Rise. Um, the other areas that I've worked extensively to are up on the Juan de Fuca Ridge here I won't mention today. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the most recent work that we did that Trish Gregg talked about yesterday where she stole my thunder, and I have nothing to say about it anymore, but I'll, I'll get to it maybe, maybe at the end. So one of the things that doesn't show up on this map is, are the seamounts. And you can see here's a map of the seamounts that's color-coded. The ones that are in blue are relatively shallow. They can be 1,000 meters. Not that that's that small, but there are literally tens of thousands of those things. And the more we look at the seafloor in detail, the more we see that there are lots of these seamounts. And then there are the major hotspot chains, like here you can see. And of course, Hawaii is sort of the classic one here. So they also create a significant portion of the oceanic crust. So what else? Well, then there's the hydrothermal vent part. And, and I'm not a hydrothermal chemist, but if you dive to the bottom of the seafloor and you're looking for active uh, lava flows or eruptions or activity on the ridge crest at all, you're going to find hyd hydrothermal vents. I remind you that it was only in the mid-70s that a few scientists went down in the Galapagos Rift and saw hydrothermal vents and giant tube worms. And they called up. You can call up from Alvin from the bottom through the water column. And they said, my god, we found like a garden of things that looks like there's these giant tube worms that look like roses. It was called Rose Garden. And literally, the people who were on the surface said, what are these guys smoking in the ball down here? This is, this is crazy. It can't be possible. And then they brought the tube worms up. And that was just in the, in the 70s, first um, recognition of that. And the importance there is that they provide the heat and chemicals that affect ocean chemistry and ultimately sustain life. And people are working on that a lot as to what the relationship is between hydrothermal activity and, and life itself. So volcanoes and vents are sort of windows into the Earth's interior. This is not the seafloor. This is a Kilauea on Hawaii. But you notice it's basically made up of a whole bunch of little plates, and they're like little spreading centers. And around the edges where it gets cold, they subduct. So in some ways, it's sort of a microcosm for the way the plates and spreading take place on the ocean floor. So it all begins with magma. Well, it would be nice to be able to sample some magma before it becomes rock, but we have yet to see a mid-ocean ridge eruption. This is relatively recent. This is in a back arc basin. 
um, where they've been fortunate enough to see some things erupt, but it's relatively shallow where they're seeing it. They're on little, little cones in the back arc basin. So we have actually seen submarine eruptions. We just haven't seen mid-ocean ridge eruptions. I've been fortunate to be involved in cruises where we were there right after eruptions. This happens to be, let me make sure, yeah. This happens to be one of the effects. This is on axial seamount on the Juan de Fuca. This is what's called a snowblower event. And I showed this early on before I talk about vents because this happens a lot. Basically, when a dike comes up before it erupts or even after it erupts here, you bring heat up from deep within the crust. And deep within the crust, there's a whole variety, literally thousands of different types of microbes. And what you're seeing here is the, is the biological flock. It's sort of a cottony uh, organic material that, the, that these microbes um, produce and live in. And when the surrounding rock gets hot, basically these microbes find a, a nice environment to live, and they create this flock. And you wind up getting this sort of a low temperature, relatively low temperature uh, hydrothermal vent. Temperatures can reach up. These, some of these microbes live in environments that are over 100 degrees C. So the thing about deep sea studies, and this is really going to be a, a broad picture study here, is that you have to involve the geosphere, the hydrosphere, and the biosphere. All those things are related. Um, we deal with geologic, biologic, and hydrological processes. So to fully understand the dynamics of this environment requires a wide range of expertise and global exploration. And I've been fortunate enough to be involved in this sort of global exploration since the early 80s. In fact, even when I was working in, in the Caribbean, we were, we were uh, finding spreading centers in the Cayman Trough back as early as the 70s and not really understanding them. So the, the deal here is that through multidisciplinary and collaborative efforts, we get to investigate um, the seafloor. Um, some of the other big pictures here, the oceans cover 75% of the surface but really less than 5% in any detail. And the detail that we can get now, probably less than 1% of the seafloor has actually been, been surveyed in the detail that we did, like on the cruise with uh, Trish to the 820 seamounts. Um, what we know about the seafloor largely has occurred in the last 50 years and largely due to technological developments. And of course, it's been crucial uh, in, in determining how the theory of plate tectonics works. Uh, these are some of my colleagues. I put that up there because uh, I could not have done most of the things I've done without having this multidisciplinary team. And in this case, these were my co-authors. And the fact that there was a bunch of us on here, the reason for that partly was because we had Dan Fenari, who is sort of a volcanologist and uh, someone who is technologically very advanced and helps deep submergent science. Deb Kelly, who's a hydrothermal geochemist. Tim Shank in the back, who's a deep sea vent biologist and Jeff Carton's Carson, who's a sort of a tectonics dynamics guy. Uh, the, all of those people I've been with at sea and worked with at various times. Here, when we were at sea, this was the last time, this was my advisor, Ian Ridley. Dan Fenari, again, who was one of the other co-chiefs. Denny Geist, who's a volcanologist. My last PhD student here, Dorsey Wanless, and myself. Uh, this was an interesting cruise, too. This was just last November, because it had my very first PhD student, my, the last one that graduated, Dorsey Wanless, and a current one over here. So we were all together. If I had gotten Ian in here, we would have had sort of three generations of people that have been working with me. So what we really want to know ultimately is, you know, why study these, these rocks is because we want to know how, how the Earth works. And if we zoom in a little bit, what we're looking at is this small area here right in the middle, this focused zone. And that's sort of important, the fact that this magmatism, even though the oceans are wide and there are seamounts, the mid-ocean ridges are very focused in, in these zones. And that is almost continuous in terms of magma production in these areas, at least in a geologic sense. And now that we've seen a number of eruptions, we realize that the, the, it, doesn't, it doesn't erupt throughout the length of a rift, which might be 20 to 60 kilometers, but rather it erupts over very small areas, but very frequently on the, on the matter of, of decades for both fast and intermediate spreading rate ridges. So one of the things that I'm going to talk about a little bit, and some of the geochemists here understand this, is mid-ocean ridge basalts, or we call them MORB. And the thing is that they're unusually depleted. They're, they're sort of the juice, the, 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 um, it's like having a snow cone. And after you take out that cherry flavor, the rest of it becomes depleted. You're just dealing with ice. On the other hand, the first hit that you get is really enriched. So in terms of the rocks, you've got these enriched rocks that tend to come up in seamounts. But at mid-ocean ridges, you get this 
depleted, icy, boring stuff, which is really interesting. <laughs> and that's, that's what I study. So I talk about things that are depleted and, and, and enriched. And largely, that depletion is due to the fact that over the past 4 billion years, we keep making continental crust. Now, some of it comes back again, and that may show up as little traces. But largely, um, by building the continental crust, you wind up depleting the mantle underneath it. And that's part of what we try to figure out is how that's happened. So zooming in a little bit. So here's a diagrammatic picture of the ridge crest. You can't, because we can only image it geophysically, we can't actually see it until you go down to the seafloor. And the most you can ever see down on the bottom, just due to lighting and turbidity and things like that, is maybe here to about the end of this room, maybe that far. So you never get a picture like that, so it always has to be diagrammatic. But from what we've seen, some of it looks like Hawaiian rift zones, right? Rather than being volcanoes, per se, they're linear features shortly segmented and they split off from one another and then form features like that. So let's zoom in a little bit more. This is the nine north section. This is the Sakaros transform here. This is the East Pacific rise. This is one of the ro most robust and magmatic areas on the seafloor. The places that I've studied over the years are the Lamont seamounts, which are this, um, this group right here, very large seamounts. The nine to 10 region that I'm going to show you is in here. This is an overlapping spreading center that actually has rocks that are as evolved as basites. In other words, they have silica contents up over 63%. And then this is the A20 seamount chain that lies just to the west of the Sikaros transform that has little spreading centers in it. So this whole area is actually quite fascinating because you have many different environments in, in which to study the, the ridge. So how do we do this? Well, largely, um, you've got to use sort of nested technology. You, you, you really can't go out, although the last cruise we did this, but it's very hard to go out or even get funded unless you've got a map, which you might get from a multi-beam on a ship like the Atlantis. That gives you sort of kilometer scale feature and view. That gives you the, the big maps. But if you want to know what's down there, you may have to use a sonar system, like a deep-toed sonar system, to look at reflectivity of the bottom. At the same time, you might also want to use some sort of a camera system. Here we've got the Argo system where you're looking at scales now. This might be in the order of kilometers. This is now in the order of meters. Once you do that and you put together a picture, then you can really use Alvin, which costs upwards of $25,000 a dive to go down and, and do sample. Um, ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, are getting more popular now. They can stay down longer, but they don't quite have the payload that, um, our, that um, HOVs have. The other thing is, even though you can sit in a control room and watch a TV, it's not the same as being down on the seafloor. Our cognitive presence down there, being able to see in 3D, is really remarkable compared to what you can get from, from an ROV. Um, just some of the tools that we use, there are some shallow subs. Uh, Alvin can go down to 4,500 meters. There's a number of ROVs that are down to about the same depth. And certainly in the Pacific and Juan de Fuca, going down to 4,000 meters gets you a, a much of the ridge crest. Uh, Sentry, this is an AUV that can do lots of, of different things depending on how you program it. You throw it over the side, it goes away for 8 or 12 hours and comes back with great pictures, data, all sorts of interesting things, chemistry. And then there are a bunch of really deep diving subs. Uh, the um, Russians have a few that they mostly use for tourism now. Uh, the Japanese have one. Chinese are building one. And then w we have also in our fleet the ROV uh, Jason, which we've used a number of times. And then there's some really deep things. We did have this um, HROV, which uh, goes down to 11,000 meters. And uh, they lost it in the Marianas Trench. Don't know what happened to it. The, the feeling was that it imploded. So. This is, this is sort of the ship of choice. That's what we're on for a month at a time. It is the mothership to a lot of these facilities. Here's a picture of the Alvin being recovered. Here's the back side of the Alvin. So this is what we used on our last cruise in November. Um, it, it can also deploy Jason. Usually they don't do them together. Uh, and then we have things like <coughs> the AUV Sentry. This is an autonomous vehicle. Here it's being shown in some very calm water. I don't know where that is. but. Um, we use them simultaneously. The Alvin can only dive for, during the day. So you would go down it would, um, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, come back up at 4, 5, 6 in the afternoon, depending upon battery power time. And then they would get the AUV ready and put that over the side. And we could, we could dredge during the night, which is the tried and true method that they've been using probably since the 1800s to pick up things. 
It's basically a couple of, of sharp blades with a chain link uh, bag on the bottom and a wire that's, uh, I think we've got 10,000 meters of wire on it. And you put it over the side. Uh, you can use um, a number of techniques to do pretty good spot dredging, but it's still pretty a ham-fisted way to get, to get samples. But we did that every night in, in certain localities. So this is, so this is uh, 9 North on these Pacific Rise, and, and it's a map. It's a side scan map. You sort of see um, these are panels that are stitched together as the vehicle went over the bottom. But uh, if you ignore some of the stripiness to it, you can see some features. So the, the axial summit trough with a rift zone right here, this is the, these are the same two images here, right? It's very narrow. You can see it's sort of rift-like in here, and it squirrels around a little bit. And then there are these sort of features like this, these lobes. And then once in a while, you can see something that goes off into the sediment. These dark areas are areas with low reflectivity, which is sediment. And you can see that this flow has sort of come off here. It's hard to know if it started at the ridge or whether it was an older one and slowly spread out. But this is this type of thing that we use to be able to predict where to go on the seafloor. The um, distance across here, just to give you an idea, is like six kilometers across the whole thing. So on a dive, you could literally go from, from here all the way across if you really hike. I tailed it. So let's see if I can get this. I think I need to come over here. This is just diagrammatic of what, how we think. Oops, go back. How we think. Come on. Nope. No. I did it before when we had it. Well, no. All right. You're going to have to believe me. We'll just move on from here anyhow. But it's sort of a diagrammatic representation of how these flows form. And what, one of the things that I'll just summarize here is basically you can get multiple flows during the same eruptive period. Some of these darker areas are more like sheet flows, and they can actually go as much as four kilometers off axis. Most of them stay in this area. These lobes are literally pillow and lobate flows that come out at various times. And what we know from studying the seafloor after eruptions where we can see young lava flows is that they come out in pulses that may last for days to, to weeks at a time. That's how long an eruption takes place. That's so it's relatively rapid. So the other thing that we uh, have used a lot is these these maps that we get from AUVs like Century. This is typical right here of what you would find. This is the, the definition you would get uh, from uh, multi-beam surveys. And you know, it's not bad. You can see this is a, a caldera actually in the southern Pacific. Um, but you can see the definition is much better here. Better here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in on this area because you can't even tell how good the definition here is here. So we're going to look at a feature right, actually right there. That's a very small feature right there in the next slide. That's the difference between them. This is a 50 meter grid. That little feature, whatever it is, it's almost indistinguishable. And here, this is actually a little bit of a dome, sort of a silicic dome on the bottom. And you can literally see sort of the, the, the flow morphology that's on the bottom. So this is where we are now, being able to use um, these AUVs to map the seafloor at, at one, one meter. Uh, this was taken from our most recent cruise on the 820 Seamount. And what I have here is I've got the samples that we took. So this would have been one that we used this map to go down and decide where to sample as we, we took this, this dive on Otto Ridge. The colors just represent the different chemistries. This is a KTI. It's, it's an indicator of enrichment. Remember I talked about depletion and enrichment. And one of the things you see here, these blue colors are depleted sort of normal mid-ocean ridge basalts. This construct here. Uh, largely sort of piles of pillows, is very different than what, what we have here, which is extremely depleted. And then just over here, and, and this, this whole dive is only a few kilometers. And then over here is another sort of a construct with a lot of lobates coming out of it, lobes of flows coming out, which is sort of intermediate to enrich composition. But that's a, that's a century map that we used on our, on our dives. So let's talk about Alvin a little bit. Now that we've got some maps and we know what we're going to go and look for, um, we are using the Alvin now. And this was updated in 2015. There was a couple of years to rebuild it. They actually made a larger sphere. Um, there is a titanium sphere right here that's a little bit uh, bigger than six foot across. Uh, you put um, a pilot <coughs> and two observers. 
the, the new version, the, the old version just used to have an observer window on one side and on the other side, and the pilot was looking out the front, which was OK, except that the pilot would go, wow, do you see that? And one of the observers would go, no, I don't see anything. And the other observers would see something else, which made it very difficult to put it all together to decide what you were actually looking at on the bottom. Now you have the ability of all three looking out of the front. Of course, we also have lots and lots of cameras now. To, so here's the frontal view. You can see that all three people in the sphere can look at it. So let's, let's go down. This is sort of a diagrammatic representation of that, that uh, new sub. One of the things I want to notice is that all the equipment that can go in here, especially if you're diving with hydrothermal chemists who put a lot of sampling bottles in here or boxes for biology, that can get filled up fast. Our precious rocks wind up having to be piled up on top of each other instead of piling them up on top of biology. But that's the price we pay for having rocks. So let's, let's take a dive. Let's see what it's like. So usually they get you up really early in the morning. You notice right here I have this uh, great uh, costume on with little black socks. You know, and it's, it's hot on the East Pacific Rise. So you go in like that. And then later on, I'll, be, I'll come out and I'll have a hat and I'll have a um, wool sweater on <coughs> because it gets cold down there. The, the ambient temperature at the seafloor is 2 degrees centigrade. Uh, it's pretty tight quarters. It's a little bit better in there now because the electronics have gotten smaller and smaller. So you've got a little bit more room. Um, looking out that front window, this is still up in the up near the surface. That's why there's a lot of light coming in. But it's, it's a lot more comfortable than it used to be, although I have to say that after eight hours, uh, it, it gets a little bit difficult. So six foot Tysanium sphere, those of you who haven't heard of it, six foot, basically my arms across. And there's going to be three of us in there, right, and six, six feet tall. It gets tight. It gets very tight in there. And you need to be good friends by the time you come out. As a pilot, a chief scientist, observer, Basically, if the battery powers last for a long time, which they're doing better and better now, it's about eight hours in the ball, as they call it. It's about two hours to get down to 2,500 meters, um, maybe four hours of bottom time doing science, <coughs> and then an hour and a half back up to the, to the surface again. Um, here's a bunch of pilots. And you can see how close quarters it is. Um, it's uh, definitely close in there. And uh, Trish Gregg. There she was. This was on her first dive. I had the honor of taking her down on her first dive. <clears throat> she was way too excited about this. <laughs> she was even excited about the lunch they give you, which is like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and uh, ham and cheese, right? Is that what you like? Was that your favorite, ham and cheese? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so what, after 250 meters, right, you start losing the ambient light. So this is what you see. Yeah, although Trish talked about the fact that there's lots of things glowing in the water. And if you look carefully and your eyes adjust, you can actually see there's a lot of life that's floating around as you go down towards the bottom. But mostly, you see this. But as you go down, after a few hours, the pilot will say, I'm turning the lights on. We're getting near the bottom. And this is what the first view of the bottom might, might look like, like that. And that's the view out that, that porthole that I uh, showed you. Uh, I remind you that it's about 2 degrees centigrade on the bottom. Uh, and the pressure um, there is about 300 bars, 4,000 PSI. So uh, for some reason, we find it important to constantly shrink cups when they go down there to make sure that the pressure is still higher than we thought, than we thought it was. And um, at some point, we realized that you could take wig heads down and you could coat those too. So, so a large portion of the US tax dollars goes to shrinking cups. <laughs> And that's, that's sort of the way. It, it turns out that Mexican cups are really good. They must be cheaper styrofoam or something, because they work really well at shrinking much smaller. Each cup is a little bit different. Put them on those jet samples. The what? Put them on those jet samples. Water yeah, samples. That's right. Go down. And any way you can get them down there, they will shrink. So um, this is what th this is an unusual view. This is actually a movie. And this is about how slow Alvin will, will move on the bottom. This was set up by Dan Fanari, who's actually in there looking out the window his, at his camera system that they dropped from the surface, basically an elevator with a camera system that was automatically controlled by him in the ball to actually show what we were doing. And this is one of the few examples of actually seeing what it's doing at, this is probably somewhere around 2,800 meters. And there's a bunch of large pillow lavas here on the side of one of the volcanoes we were studying. 
So what else do we see? Moving away from the seamount, which is where that Alvin picture was, there's lots of strange features that you probably don't hear about very much. And East Pacific Rise is particularly like that. One thing is called lava pillars. And you can see these things that were at one time called bathtub rings. They're still not really well understood, but it has something to do with vapor interacting with lava lakes. These basically form in, in big lava lakes or in the axis of the, of the spreading center. Pillow lava is pretty common here. We have a little bit of spill out. Sometimes they fill, fill up and the front of them will, will break off or explode off and you wind up getting smaller and smaller little squirrely pillows. This is a holothurian on the bottom over there. One of the major types that you don't hear about are lobate flows. And they are large interconnected lobes. And you can see the difference between this and the very well-formed pillows. You also notice in here, I'll show you, that there's, there's a cavity underneath them. And it turns out that these are not all that solid. In some cases they are, but largely there's cavities underneath. Again, an indication of how lava will interact with seawater on the seafloor as they flow over it fairly rapidly. Uh, the staining here, basically it's uh, sulfur staining. And th this is because around the edges of these, where it's open to the seafloor, uh, you get um, hydrothermal activity, low, very low temperature hydrothermal activity. So again, you can't see what the ridge looks like at over any distance. So I created this diagram that basically shows you some of the features. This would be the axial summit trough or the rift zone. And things are really concentrated. If, if there are dikes that are feeding the lava flows, the dikes seem to occur right along this, this single point. Um, the hydrothermal activity is very much focused right within the axis itself. The feeling is, is that this really fills up with lava and overflows to the side, giving you a whole bunch of lava flows, which then collapse. Um, and then it drains back again, and it leaves a lot of shattered pieces of basalt around the edges of this drained lava lake and these sheet flows in, in the bottom of, of the lake. So in the scale here, here's Alvin just for scale about how big this is. Some, a lot of times you can get into the axis and drive along, certainly when we're sampling hydrothermal fluids are in there, but sometimes it actually gets narrow enough that you can't and you have to come back out again. The other thing I want to point out are these pillow mounds, that these are not formed, they may form close to the axis and raft off, but largely they occur along faults that occur some kilometers off axis, and they seem to be sourced by something different than what erupts in the axis itself. Um, so some of the features. Here's, here's the sort of sheet flows off axis with a bunch of uh, pillows over sheet flows. And this is the type of thing that erupts off axis on top of what's already been erupted. Here's some lava pillars like this one. This is the top of it. Sometimes they actually vent out of the top. So the inside of these pillars are hollow. And the outside has been clenched uh, along um, as, as the lava flows filled up in the lava lake. Uh, here's a lobate collapse. That's what this areas are like where they collapse in here. And there's lots of that on East Pacific Rise. And then one of the things that's, that was told us about this vapor lava interaction is the fact that there are lava drips underneath some of these lobates. Now, if you think about it, if you erupt a lava on the seafloor, two degrees centigrade, it immediately forms a glass. It doesn't flow any place. That, that's what's so good about sampling them. To have a drip, you have to have temperatures that are upwards of seven or 800 degrees centigrade for it to drip into. It can't drip into a vacuum, right? There is no vacuum down there. So these things are forming in some sort of a superheated uh, vapor phase that forms when the ridges erupt. An another picture of some of the lava pillars that hold up the lava lakes. After the lake drains away, um, we get a lot of collapse. So there's a lot of collapse debris in here. But the pillars along the edges often stand up, and they create these, these nice little chapel-like features. And here's a close-up of what one of those pillars looks like. And you can see that they're not really um, bathtub rings. They're more like cusps, like bubbles, like elongated bubbles that form in there. Uh, this was one of the areas. Here's one of these lobate flows again with the drips underneath. It's a little bit hard to see in this picture. But I'll show you what the drips look like. So this is the underside of the lava flow. This side is all glassy. You notice this side doesn't really have a lot of glass. But, but look at the drips that are underneath this. And sometimes there are some very strange mineralogies, including uh, we found halite here, which suggests that it's sort of a briny fluid uh, vapor phase. Uh, just some other uh, picture, pictures of things you see in the bottom. Sometimes these things are fluid enough, they create pohoi hoi like flows, or a, a ropey sheet flow. Um, here's one with low temperature venting around a bunch of pillows with a, with a larger pillow over a bunch of more low-bated pillows. 
Uh, this is one of the few massive flows. This was actually drilled in IODP at one time, trying to drill into bare rock. Those of you who are familiar with the deep sea drilling program, um, you realize that we've hardly drilled uh, anywhere near the whole thickness of the oceanic crust. And the problem is getting in, because you saw all that debris, it basically just breaks up the drill strings, the, the drill heads. But they were able to spud in here and get some 5 to 10 meters, and then they hit a, a rubbly zone and couldn't, um, couldn't go any further. Uh, still have no idea. These are all Galatheid crabs or rock lobsters. I don't know where they are going, but it looks like it's an important thing headed up towards the north here. <laughs> so this is a diagrammatic thing from NOAA. Um, they cr created this digital image just to give you an idea. So this is flying over a collapsed lava lake. And there's a few pillars left on the side, a few little chapel-like features. And then the scale you can see here. That thing's called a rumbleometer in the middle of it. This was axial volcano on the Juan de Fuca, which actually recorded the inflation of the caldera and then the ultimate eruption. And then here's another, an ROV just for, for scale. So science at sea, what do we do? Well, after the sub comes up, we have to distribute the samples. And you can see people tend to hang around because they want to see what's going on. Tim Shank here is probably yelling at me because there's some biology in this bio box, and I'm concerned about the rocks. You notice that the biologists also make me wear gloves now so I don't get my nasty human bacteria mixed up with uh, subsea bacteria. Uh, the lab, this was on our cruise, this Ian Ridley. You see Steve here looking very concerned, thinking about diamonds and why is he out at sea at this point. <laughs> And uh, this is what he did. You know, he was he was there. He took his first first dive. He got in for his first first time uh, into the sub. Uh, he had to go through training in case we threw him overboard at any one time. He was going to have to have his suit to do that. Here he is, very happy standing standing out there. And of course, eating his. I think this was your pre-dive meal. Was that right? Because it looks pretty sparse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you gotta eat like. Yeah, you don't want to eat a lot before you go down in the sub. Uh, Trish always eats that way, so we have no idea how much she did eat of that. Uh, rocks come up. You eventually bring them in to get cut. And you can see here was uh, one of Trish's students. Um, she really enjoyed cutting the rocks. You saw Steve yesterday cutting it. Uh, he didn't get quite as messy as uh, Haley did here. This is one of my students describing the rocks. So we spent a lot of time on shifts. We are working basically 24 hours a day, three different shifts, uh, people constantly cutting the rocks describing the rocks and sampling the rocks. So what do they do with them? So, so here's a nice glassy one. Uh, this was from these specific rocks. You see the beautiful glass on the surface. And this is what's ideal to, um, to sample for geochemistry. We will take them back and cut them and make typical thin sections. Here we've got sort of a fine grain matrix. This is only 10 millimeters across here. But we've got little olivine grains and plagioclase grains. And they're ubiquitous in these lavas. While we're at sea this last time, we actually took glass chips off, put them on a mount. This is only two centimeters across. So each one of these was a separate uh, location on this dive 4847. And then we can analyze them by microprobe and by laser ablation mass spectrometry. So we get major elements and trace elements on all the rocks just with these few chips. And within those chips, we can do things like this backscattered image of an olivine, a couple of spinels in it, and then some glass inclusions. And it's these sorts of inclusions that people are using to look at more primary melts and also to look at primary volatile contents. And I'll talk about that in a, in a second. But we can, we can use things like the ion probe here to get CO2 and H2O. And that'll give us some indication not only of the ultimate source, but also of the depth of equilibration. So on to the hydrothermal story. I'm reading a little late here. But so um, there's lots of hydrothermal chimneys. This happens to be up on Endeavor segment. These are 30 meter high chimneys that have been active for as long as people have dis discovered it. Um, the way hydrothermal systems work is basically someplace down below, some five to, uh, well, uh, the top of this sort of magma source, if you will, might only be at a few kilometers below the seafloor. <coughs> Cold water goes in, this very porous uh, upper crust gets heated up, and then comes back out as, as hydrothermal chimneys. In doing so, it picks up a lot of sulfur, iron, manganese, copper, chrome, a whole bunch of things that form um, sulfides. So these chimneys are not rock per se. They're not basalt rock. They're made up of um, mostly sulfide minerals. And where they're hot around the edges, it's somewhere between three and 400 degrees here in the chimney. 
it's two degrees outside. So in this outside area around here, you wind up getting the voluminous type that we think of as vent communities. Sometimes the temperature is a little lower and you don't have a lot of black smoke. You can see a sort of white smoke here. And you've got these giant uh, vestimentifera two berms. There's a little bit of a close-up. I love this picture. It's a little bit old now, but it just shows how uh, healthy this is. These are the vestimentifera two berms. Uh, there's amphipods amphipods that swim around in, uh, in the uh, mineral-rich waters. Um, sometimes there are crabs, mussels, clams, the very typical East Pacific Rise community. And there's lots of black smokers. This one happens to go up to 417 degrees C. I don't know if we've gotten any higher than 417 so far. And that's just by measuring the outflow. If you actually could get deeper into it, you might find out the temperature's a little higher. So a couple, couple of videos just showing you what these things look like. This is sort of a compilation of, um, you can see these things really pump out a lot of material. The actual fluid uh, is not black until it hits the seawater. So there's always those hydrothermal streaming that you see is a mixture of the vent fluid as well as seawater. But you can imagine how it changes the chemistry of seawater as this has been done for literally millions of years. This is on the Juan de Fuca Ridge. That's uh, Bob Embley in the background. He's, he was actually describing this when he was down on the, on the seafloor. And those chimneys can form in a matter of days to weeks and then fall over, create a lot of debris at the base of them, and then start to form again. So one of the things that scientists have been able to do is if you don't have a sub or an ROV, is you can uh, take a camera system or you can use an AUV, and you can use sort of a sniffer that sniffs out things like sulfur or manganese or iron. Uh, and, and it would define what's called a plume or a mega plume. And particularly when there's an eruption, there's a lot of this that goes on. The chimneys start to form almost immediately. And you could, I, I would say, smell, if you will, you could smell the fact that there was an eruption by looking for, for mega plumes. So the, the, the sulfides that are formed are things like pyrite and chalcopyrite. Fool's gold is, is a typical mineral that these would be made of. A little bit lower temperature, but still hot. Like I say, some of these worms <coughs> can be in 100 degree water. A lot of them seem to form at um, 23, 24 degrees. They seem to like that. This is a, a recent horror film that I've made. <laughs> Some of these things are really ugly. And sometimes we have to share the, the biologists and the geologists have to share, share labs. Not fun. Uh, this is, so one of the things that's happened is you know, our digital photography has become so much, so much better in recent years that, that the new cameras are just so sensitive that you can really see some of the, some of the details, like the shrimp that are here. These are blind, but they have little thermistors on their back that allows them to find hot fluids, and then they come in and eat the bacteria. Remember the white flock I showed you at that low temperature vent? This is all bacterial flock on the side of these chimneys created by the bacteria, and the shrimp come in and graze on them. And then here's one of these sampling devices that made probably a thermometer in there, but it's also connected to like a titanium evacuated uh, canister that when they open it, it basically sucks up those fluid for chemists to, to study the fluid composition. Uh, low temperature vent right within the rocks. Here again, we've got two worms growing right from the rocks. So not really at a vent here. But because the seafloor is hot uh, and it's bringing up minerals that can be oxidized by the bacteria, the bacteria start to colonize. And then the two worms find a way to colonize on top of that. They work in a symbiotic relationship with the bacteria. Uh, it's all chemosynthetic processes that are involved. Clam field, just to give you an idea of how big the clams are. Tim is a normal sized person, so those are, those are big clams. But they all smell of sulfur, that smell, that rotten egg smell, because they're the sulfide uh, eating bacteria, if you will. Uh, the Atlantic has a, a whole different biology, very different for the biologist here as a chimney in, in the Atlantic. You notice also there's a little uh, brachyurine crab in here too. But these things are all over this chimney. Come back to that again. Um, 
Um, here's one that shows this is an eel palp that's living in there. You see the brachyurine crabs are in there. Sometimes there's uh, octopi that swim around the vents as well. And I just remind you that this is a chemosynthetic thing. And I think uh, it's a very active field right now. They're literally finding thousands of different microbes. In fact, I just went to a meeting before I came here where they're talking about the number of viruses that they're finding that are there uh, within the vents as well. So um, as Steve mentioned, I was fortunate enough to be around when we were studying these specific rise when there was eruption in 1991-92. In 1989, we had imaged the seafloor, and we knew that there were a lot of vents there. Um, so we went back in 91 to try and sample the vents, and we couldn't find them. Now, if you think about 1991, GPS was not real great. You sort of knew where the ship was, but you have a real hard time figuring out where the Alvin is because you can't use GPS when you're on the seafloor. You have to triangulate. So we thought we were maybe in the wrong place. But one of the things that was really different was this, which is so-called tuberum bar barbecue. This is a folded sheet flow here. These are the carcasses of the tuberms that used to be the vent. Two things to notice here. One, where well, you can't really see it. Some of the carcasses are actually embedded in the lava flow. Some of these carcasses, when we got there, still had living Vestimentifera tuberms in the, in the front part that had not been encapsulated in, in the lava flow. The other thing is, is that there's no crabs here. And one of the things we know now is that if this happens, the crabs come back in really fast to eat these barbecued tuberms. So this is what an eruption looks like, or just after the eruption. We may have been there at the time. Here's what a young lava flow looks like. This is a 1991 flow. Here's a field of mussels and clams, and you can see it just ran, ran over that. And this is, a, this is about, oh, I don't know, 100 meters from the axis. And you can see some parts get run over and some parts don't. Um, the bacterial flock. As soon as the seafloor heats up, this is what you see. You put a little marker down here. All of this white material was actually going up uh, into the water column because of the, the heat differential, the low density fluids that were coming out. But so this is what an eruption looks like, not what you'd think it looks like. T something that's covered with like a white moss uh, doesn't seem to strike me as being a good indicator of an eruption, but it was. The other thing we did, we came back in 92, and we actually found, we went further north, and we actually found this rift like this, which is right along the axis. And as we followed it, it, it opened up wider and wider. So this is literally, if you will, the top of the dike. This is, this is where it's coming up and filling up a lava lake. Uh, and this, was, this had erupted in 92. So the eruption basically took place over two years in 1991 and 1992. So what do I do, other than talk about all the stuff that goes on that I have nothing to do with? But you know, I, I worry about major and trace element variations, right, and isotopes as well. And what does it do? It gives us temperatures and depths of formation talks about magma evolution. Just by looking at this is basically the magnesium oxide content versus a whole bunch of other major and minor elements here. The, the colors on here are basically how close they are to the axis. And one of the things you see is the things that are higher MGO and higher temperature tend to erupt close to the axis. And those that we find off axis are actually um, much cooler, much more evolved. And there's a whole story within that that I can't get into too much. But we try to figure out the different genetic relationships between these different flows. In other words, how enriched or depleted are they? And I'll just point out one thing. is When you look at this potassium up here, which is a very incompatible element in, in the magnets, um, is that there's a group down here that have very low K2O. And then you see these ones that have enriched K2O. So those are what are called EMORB, or enriched MORB, and these are depleted MORB. If I get to show you the seamount samples, you'll notice that we have a tremendous greater, much, much greater range than what you see here compared, compared to what we found on the, on the seamounts. So um, we worked in this area, at so-called Nine North, for a decade, maybe even a little bit more. And that was driven largely by hydrothermal activity and biologists. They kept funding us, and we kept going back and sampling. And it's the most heavily sampled area on the seafloor. We were taking Alvin samples, but we were also doing something called rock coring, where you hit the seafloor with a, a, a probe that's got wax in it, and you pick up little bits of glass. So we were literally able to make a map of what the compositions were on the seafloor. And you can see, here's this hot area where the new eruption had been. The uh, green areas are much more evolved, so they're cooler, and they tended to occur along little rifts. Same thing here. These were cooler and also more enriched areas. 
here, this shows up a little better. Here's this what we call KTI ratio. So all the normal things seem to erupt in the axis. And then when off-axis eruption is created, things are a little bit more enriched. There's a detail of that. So each one of these spots is actually a sample we have. And we can make these maps of the seafloor. So what did that do? That, that gave us an indication of what was going on. And some of the features that were taking place, some of the processes were fractional crystallization, where the rocks basically crystallize at depth. We also indicated that there's probably magma mixing. So this is the diagrammatic picture of what's happening in the so-called magma chamber. This is circa 90s, early 2000s. And you see we have sort of a big, mushy zone. We've got a magma lens underneath the ridge. And here's that little area we've been studying, which is up here. But with our um, off-axis sampling, we were actually getting out a few kilometers so we could tell something else that was going on on the side. We also saw melt rock reaction and crustal assimilation. This study that I did with Steve looking at chlorine suggested that there's assimilation as these magmas come up. They, they assimilate and partially melt the, the crust around them. Ultimately, we wanted to look at the sources. So we would look at variable and mantle sources, the mineralogic control, uh, cryptic chemical variations, variable extents of melting and depths of melting. All of these things are things we've been working on for the last 20 years to try and sort out how the whole system works. The model for mid-ocean ridges, though, has, has evolved. Um, people who studied ophiolites, which are pieces of oceanic crust thrust up on land, came up with a model that looks like this, where it doesn't have a big magma chamber, but it has a whole bunch of what are called sheeted sills, rather than one big magma chamber. And it turns out that geophysicists who were doing seismic imaging on the Juan de Fuca and on East Pacific Rise found that here's the axis. And they found that there were these sills, these magma bodies, that were actually pretty deep. And they were a couple of kilometers off axis. These were all individual sills here. So we started to look at our data compared to this. And with a postdoc I have, we, we came up with a model that was a little bit different. So this would be the old mushy magma chamber. But the reality is there's lots of things going on throughout the column. This would be maybe five, five kilometers deep. The mantle would be down here someplace. And it's cooler on the outside, so you wind up getting more evolved lavas. And you're also seeing less mixing, which allows you to see things that are more enriched away from the major axis, where most of the mixing takes place. So that's, that's sort of the current state of the art, if you will. So 2005, 2006, we're still studying it. We come back there again. Um, geophysicists put down some ocean bottom seismometers to look for earthquakes that might be taking place all the time down there. We can't find them. They got caught in a new lava flow. Same place, 13 years later. We have no idea what the time scales for eruptions are. Some of them made it back. Some of them didn't do so well. But again, when you, when you look at really recent flows, this is the 2005, 2006 flow over the 91, 92 flow. And you can see the difference between the two of them based on the reflectivity of the of the surface. This was pre, this was 2004. It's a very instrumented vent down in the bottom. You can see all these instruments sort of measuring lots of chemical and thermal properties of this. When we came back, and now we really know where we are. When we came back, that's what it looked like. Similarly, vent called Teak event, 2004. When we came back, that's what it looked like. So this repaving, this activity, and we're talking about the Mid-Ocean Ridge being a very, very active volcano. It's just that they're not um, big eruptions, at least as far as we can tell. Similar thing happened, bacterial mats, new tube worm colonies starting up almost immediately. And my part of this, again, was to look at how the chemistry had changed. And in this case, this was the 91, 92 eruption here. And then this was the new eruption. It actually had a couple of different parts to it, different compositions. What was interesting is mostly we think of new eruptions putting in new, very hot mafic magma. In other words, we would think of new magma being over here someplace. It turns out that instead, we were looking at some sort of residual magma that was evolving and cooling with time. And we were able to map the flow and get samples all the way along. So this is, sort of, again, the state of the art of where we are, where we are now. Some of the other information you can get is depths of crystallization. Turns out that at least some of these samples had chemistry that suggested there was high pressure crystallization rather than shallow crystallization. 
And that was confirmed to a certain extent by some work that uh, Dorsey Wanless, my ex-PhD student, did with Wanless and Shaw. They looked at the melt inclusions, and the depth of equilibration was anywhere from just about at the mantle here, all these rocks here. These are uh, fluid inclusion, melt inclusions in olivine. And you can see the depth was a lot of them occurred, equilibrated right at the boundary where the magma lens is. But you can see that there's actually a fair number of them that showed equilibration pressures much deeper. The other thing that we found out by doing these detailed studies is that the seismologists, when they looked at the reflectivity of the melt lens, found little gaps in the melt lens. So a long axis, it's not continuous. It's literally these relatively small scale of five kilometer melt lenses that feed the lavas up above. And what we found from our studies was not only are they broken up into these segments, but actually each one of these areas had a slightly different chemistry. So it's not just one big magma chamber, it's not one big long 20 kilometer rift, but rather it's things that are small and um, eruptable over very short, short time periods. And then I had another postdoc who came up with a model for it, which here is quite complicated. Uh, that may be the take home message is that we know a lot about it, but also it turns out it's not a, it's not a simple system. There's a lot of things going on. So to end up with, this is what uh, Trish Gregg talked about yesterday. In order to try and figure out what's actually happening in the mantle, you need to get away from the spreading centers. Here, here this is looking along axis. This is the nine north spreading center. Here's the Sequeiros. And here's the A20 seamounts that come out from the ridge. So the study that we've done and are working on right now is to say, OK, if everything's mixing really well underneath the ridge and there's a lot of melt, what happens off axis? So we've been studying this chain of seamounts, the A20 seamount chain. And you see how different they are than the single seamount chains. This is one almost continuous line of constructive volcanism. And in detail, this was our multi-beam map. You can see how complicated they are. They don't look like volcanoes. There's a few things that look like little pancake-like volcanoes. But otherwise, this is one big mass of, of volcanism that we have yet to understand. And we had a number of alvin dives. That would be sort of a typical alvin, alvin dive on the bottom. For one of, this is in uh, Leona Seamount. And I just end up with this. So here's, this is what the specific rise looks like down here. Most of the compositions look like this. There are a few little crosses here that are a little bit more enriched. When you look at the seamounts, not only do they look like the ridge, like these, but they also look like some of the most enriched things that we've, we've ever seen within the oceans. And within an individual seamount, you can see you've got depleted, moderately enriched, and very enriched lavas, all within a few hundred meters. So our task now is to figure out what the heck is going on? And ultimately, it'll lead us back to some complicated models like this, but uh, that's, where, that's where, the, where the fun is. And uh, so the, the last model I have here, one is probably the really true one. And uh, we're, you know, we're going to try and figure out what those guys are doing down there and uh, how they're replenishing melt. I thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, yeah. When, uh, that's what it seemed like. And they look like some of the things that are off of Hawaii. Dave Clegg has talked about these things. They're forming ponds and then draining and partially collapsing. Um, again, the view, so we've got nice little maps of them. And then the view from the submersible, they just had pillows. It wasn't anything different. So we're, now we're trying to relate the chemistry of them. It looks like maybe they're all depleted and maybe they were early on. Because some of them look like they're tucked underneath the major edifices. but. Yeah, another thing that, that we're working on. Yeah. Yeah. Make the what the? A day site. Oh, a day site. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, it, almost always these things, so, so in petrologic terms, basalts are things that would commonly erupt in Hawaii. They're sort of the, the, the parental things. As they cool and evolve, you get andesites and then dacites. But that's pretty far. You need like 90% crystallization to do that, right? So there's, there's two things you have to know about this. Is that almost in every place where we find andesites and dacites, it's at the edge of a, end of a ridge segment. The ones on the EPR are at an overlapper. And one of them is propagating into old crust. 
So it gives you a cool environment that doesn't constantly remix. The other thing is that the trace elements tell you that they're probably assimilating some partial melts in the crust. So the basalts come up, they start to assimilate, they cool down, they fractionate, and then they mix with this assimilant. And you get you can model that as basite. Some people would argue, but it's but it seems to work pretty well. So, another good question. You need to come and see me. <laughs> but um, the basalts show a continuum, and then sometimes what happens is it jumps over to andesite and dacite, and there's basaltic andesites. So there's a gap in there. It's like the so-called daily gap where there's some missing things. Sometimes it's the whole thing. But there's definitely this mixing, and it's always mixing between some really evolved basalt and dacite, or maybe even something higher silica, like a rhyodacite. Right? So, and, you know, th and that might be the partial melt ember. Nobody has really identified what that is exactly, but the, the lines on diagrams always point to something in, in that direction that may be 70% silica. Yeah. But you don't find them on a normal, normal ridge, they're, they're pretty monotonous. You know, starts off 8.5% MGO, goes to 7.5%. Yeah. So a couple things. The, the axial material does tend to be the most homogenous, which sort of fits with it just mixing a lot. If you're erupting every 10 years, you probably have a very active magmatic system. The, the more you go off axis, the more the diversity gets. And that's where we see the E-types. There are only a few places where we found E-type on axis. I mean, really, just a few places. Almost everything else is garden variety and N-type morph. So the idea is when you go off axis, you don't have as much mixing. Um, you can wind up seeing more of the diversity of the different types. I mean, the, all that diversity you saw, basically you were saying that there's sort of a mixing between them, right? I think, I think you do see them off axis. You see them either off axis or you see them sometimes at propagators, where again, they're not mixing so much. But the lavas also tend to be more evolved off axis as well, which might just be that plumbing system. Those sills, ultimately you've got to go from a magma chamber to, to crust. So it's got to go from 1200 degrees to something that's 20 degrees, whatever it is, you know, it's called. So it's got a fractionate too. So interesting. Yeah. At that range of steps, the daily gap is is the garden variety stuff. Absolutely. So it's it's about seven oh three five. <laughs> seven oh three five. So, yeah. so the question is is it is it uh, it's a good question. The other thing about that uh, is that there's this core, well, okay, so KTI correlates almost exactly with lanthanum, samarium, a whole bunch of other things. I haven't, I haven't tried doing thorium, lanthanum, which is what Kate seems to plot all the time, but the great correlation between them. The other unusual thing is that there are hardly any high MGO, high KTI. There's almost a, a great correlation between KTI and MGO, which doesn't make sense, but that might be because it's another source. Yeah, right. But, but all, of, all of the experimental studies I've looked at, even when you melt the peroxides, you still get parents that are you know, 8, 9, 10, 10%. But, but maybe then they fraction it. I don't know. But it's remarkable, that correlation. There's this great MG, well, there's a spread of MGO, but there's no high KTI, high MGO lavas, like higher than 8. So I, no, I agree. I, I, think, I think there's that other source that's, that's involved, that's enriched. Yeah, you, you, you can do that. Basically, some sort of a mixing, just a, a basic yeah, mixing. The reason I say that is, is that the bulk axis is the Because the isotopic values of those enriched ones off axis are different, they're more radiogenic, it's got to be a different source.
You mean from a physical point of view, like the plumbing system? Yeah. 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 If if you take Okay, let me let me see if this makes sense. So the most enriched things we found on axis happen to be right down by Sakaros. And they seem to form an end member in a lot of things. I don't know if you've got anything more, but those E types on Sakaros. If you take that and say, okay, that's the pure mantle derived end member, and you mix that with sort of a generic morb that's also parental, it's only, you only need about 10% to get that, those off axis things. 10% by weight, if you mix them. You, you could get the off axis, the typical off axis one, by mixing 10% of that very enriched end member. In terms of the total volume, I know we'll talk about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, but in, just in terms of the chemistry, if you take this end member and more to get to the ones that are off axis, you just have to add 10%. Well, I'm just yeah. Physically, yeah. I, I think part of that problem is what it, what's happening in the melt lens, what's happening in those sills rather than just a magma chamber. That's another part because. If you really believe that some of those things that are coming off axis are formed from sills that are unconnected to the main magma chamber, that simple mixing now becomes, it's, it's a moot point. It's got to be something that's happening in the plumbing system at that point. But it's all pretty narrow. I mean, it's all taking place over a 10 kilometer swath when you talk about the mantle melting over hundreds of kilometers. Right? But that's why the seamounts are sort of cool, because they're really showing a lot of, a lot of diversity on individual cones. Yeah. I, I, I think it's got to be sub-kilometer scale. <laughs> Again, it depends on how those things wind up coming up to the surface. But when you can sample one cone here and walk you know, 50 meters that way, and there's another one that's got a completely different composition, mantle composition, right? Yeah, what, is, what does that say? Now, we don't have any timing. That's the problem is you don't really know the time. But they're all sitting on top of these constructions. So I can't imagine that this thing over here is 100,000 years old and this thing over here is 10,000 years old. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, physically, I don't know how it, how it happens. The plumbing system is hard. It's great when you just take a whole bunch of rocks and you draw that big diagram like I had with you know, melts coming up. But actually to do it on a sort of a scale, yeah, it's very hard. You know, Ocean Leadership's a funny thing. It's, it's the big sort of overarching community organization we have that supports ocean science at all levels. And um, most of my experience there, which has been probably the last 10 years, has been more political. It's like making, making sure that ocean science goes forward and, and making the case in Congress and with the public that it's important to know about the oceans for uh, fisheries, climate, resources, um, uh, sea level change, those sorts of things. Just supporting all of them. I mean, it's so broad that th there are some plans about things that they think need to be done. But it really is more global about we need to know about everything about the oceans, and we don't know enough now. And in order to be sustainable on this planet, we need to know all of these things. And as, as I sort of showed you, is that all of these things are interconnected. At least the, 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 I didn't talk about climate change or anything like that. But that so much of the ocean is one big system. Well, the Earth is a system, right? And if you don't know about 70% of it, then you're missing a lot. So I think that's mostly what ocean leadership does. And I think they have to because AGU does some, you know, GSA does some, and they're all help. But you really need a, a big organization that has 100 universities and, and institutes with some power behind it to go up to Congress and say, hey, this is an important thing. You need to support this. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, let, let's um, remind ourselves that Mike will be around for months, mm -hmm. almost Thanksgiving. Yep. Yep. He's got plenty of chan chance to talk to people. 
made out of a really interesting uh, perspective on the oceans. There's lots of interesting things that he's going to be doing. He's talking to him. He's going to give a talk on November 1st to the postdoc uh, mm -hmm. forum on uh, kind of the career decisions and also maybe even the post uh, career mm -hmm. uh, not just ESC, but you know how, how the system works and how, how, so how the funding right. works and everything. Right. Right. So uh, that's at 11 o'clock on November 1st. Let's give Mike a nice round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.